Andy. Hello. This is just Thank you, Thunder. a sound check. Yes, great. It's okay. good to see you. Calisto, <laughs> it's been a while, huh? Good to see you. I used to hang with Calisto through the New Media Consortium back in 2006, right? <laughs> mm. Yep, long time. Welcome, welcome. Let's see. And I'm so glad Marley's session's going well. They have a good turnout. I normally like to be the person drawing with them, right? Creating prim and, and uh, reflecting on emotions. So I do highly recommend her session if you uh, have not done it before. She'll be doing another one coming up in about a month, so in April. Welcome. All of the seats are good seats. <laughs> at the top of the hour, I'll get us started. Let's see. Here we go. Hello and welcome to the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education 2021 Reconnaissance. We want to thank the conference organizers, volunteers, our hosts, the University of Rockcliffe, where would we be without them? Yay, Buffy! And for hosting <laughs> this marvelous conference, we're having a great time. I'm Lear Lobo, known as Cynthia Culloin. Yep, it rhymes with coin. <laughs> great to share our explorations in artificial intelligence education and research with you. Now, you all know who I am, but uh, for those who don't, I'm Education Co-Chair of the Nonprofit Commons Board share some of these responsibilities with Buffy, Janet Chatenoir, and, and, and Val Librarian. I'm a professor, researcher, author, game enthusiast, and software engineer. And I also thank our new board members who've joined us as well. I'm blessed with you. I wanted to take just a moment to thank you for coming. You are wonderful companions and friends as I travel through these lands. And, you know, I just marvel at the art of the possible and how you have stimulated my life. You know, the last 15 years I've been, well, 16 now, here in, uh, in Second Life and in other virtual worlds. Each of you has touched my life in ways that are breathtaking and profound. And I wanted to thank you just for a moment for being so generous in giving us your time and devotion. When you come to these events and you share in the chat log, you make it come alive. Us and for you. Well, some of you know that I teach in virtual worlds, and I love it. I'm fully integrated. I don't consider this my second life, but my life, you know. <laughs> and of course, I teach for four different schools. I've been teaching for 25 years, but I'm really a software engineer and a gamer. Today's session is called A Competency-Oriented Framework, Artificial Intelligence Education in Virtual Worlds. You know, we're sharing the machine learning and artificial intelligence research of my counterpart in crime here, Dr. Andrew Stricker, best known as Spinoza Quinnell in the metaverse. Now, Spinoza is my high school and college friend who invited me in 2008 to participate in this research, our wonderful quest for knowledge. You know, and he began his proof of concept in virtual worlds when he designed the hostage rescue game and air base and quite a few builds. And of course, the grand prize winning Mars Expedition Strategy Challenge. His wonderful team at Air University saved their lunch money for over a year. Often we're asked, how do you fund these things? How do you get things done? Well, we have commitment. We, we fund them ourselves. And of course, he's devoted to funding the research in these worlds. And then, of course, encouraging you know, Air, Air University and other groups to participate. He is an education innovation analyst with the Air University's LeMay Center for Doctrine Development and Education. Spinoza conducts research in future concepts and advancement in cognitive sciences and artificial intelligence for innovative applications in professional military. His research addresses augmented cognition and developmental growth, reflective mindsets, and contemplative practices. Sounds like a mouthful, but you'll see how it unfolds. 
He also engages in collaborative design of assistive, immersive 3D virtual and augmented reality simulations for helping to improve complex problem solving and among teams. His graduate work was conducted at the Texas A&M University College Station, Texas and Yale University, uh, New Haven, Connecticut and he is a member of the American Psychological Association. In 2020, he was elected to the Board of Directors of the International Board of Standards in Performance Training and Instruction. Our companions at Virtual Harmony feature our science fiction librarian and the, Cal the librarian of Caledon, J.J. Drinkwater. Virtual World Best Practices in Education <coughs> Thinkerer from 2018, Dr. Barbara Truman, as you may know as Delightful Doangle here in Second Life. Dr. Frank Francisca Yanacura is, uh, as Frankie Antonelli in Second Life, inspires us with her research as one of our co-authors on our books as well. And then our heart sisters who inspire us, Betty Stricker, known as Algernon Boire, and Kathy Flitter as Lynn Skylark. Together, we form the Harmony Art Society. Well, without further ado, let me turn it over to Noza Quinnell, I call him Spin, who will, <laughs> who will introduce us uh, on our ongoing quest to understand and demystify complex problems. Over to you, Spin. Oh, wow, that was an awesome introduction. And, and uh, it, you know, in, in reality, uh, my life is, is mostly spent cleaning out uh, stalls here on the farm. And... <laughs> In the free time, uh, I am just uh, you know so fortunate to be uh, able to be with such fine uh, friends and colleagues uh, over the years. I, I guess now uh, we've been working and and sharing our lives uh, for uh, wow, ever since uh, high school in some ways. So it's been an awesome journey. Uh, today uh, we're we're talking about. Um, uh, some of the nuts and bolts behind the things that we do with our uh, virtual community called Virtual Harmony. And it, uh, the genesis of the concept of Virtual Harmony originates with a small town that uh, we hail from, New Harmony, uh, from uh, southern Indiana. It's a utopian community that was started in the early 1800s. And, and um, uh, they've always had a, a kind of a, a thing for innovation and entrepreneurship and uh, coming up with new forms of uh, community, uh, and so we just kind of extended that and, and keep it going. So uh, let me jump into the into the uh, the first uh, uh, slide. Thank you so much uh, for for helping with the slides. The uh, uh, this gave you a quick backdrop on on this work. Um, the the Air Force has been uh, working uh, fairly intently with. Um, advancing artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in all kinds of ways uh, through the Department of Defense. And so we've been uh, uh, keeping close tabs and I, I work in that area uh, on behalf of the Air Force. And so they have recently come up uh, through the Department of Defense with this really interesting uh, education framework for helping our country uh, be prepared for um, the advances being made in AI and machine learning. You know, so there's a lot of exciting work going on in industry, uh, and so we're uh, uh, learning as we're going, so to speak. But but they they come up with this 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 framework that talks about these um, archetypes. You know, the things that we want to try to help uh, be better prepared for in how we educate uh, our future students. So so there is a there is a recognition that we're going to have uh, people that really ought to be able to lead AI efforts. And, and there's going to be some people that are going to uh, enable a lot of the future possibilities, <clears throat> what we commonly call in our small uh, group, uh, the art of the possible by driving AI. And, and there's a lot of, of similarities between leading and driving, but in, in a way that they're kind of different. A person that's going to drive uh, AI is going to be a little more in tune with the tools and capabilities and be able to speak to that uh, in, in, in really uh, uh, deep ways. 
And then there's there's people that we anticipate, of course, that are going to be creating AI. They're, they're going to be individuals that um, are going to actually see a need and think about ways to apply it. And, and by the way, the way that we are approaching this in the Air Force is, you know, if you're a practitioner and you see, you know, where uh, AI and machine uh, learning can benefit uh, to help, you know, improve accuracy or speed, uh, we, we cherish those insights. And so we think that's going to be a key part for us to nurture. And then there's people that are going to embed AI. You know, these are the people that really have to work through the nits and grits, right, of, okay, well, how do we make this work? It looks like, it looks like a grand thing on paper, but now how do we actually get it going so that, um, you know, it, it's really helping us? And then the facilitation of, of AI is, is, is where, you know, a lot of you that uh, I, I'm sure that are sitting out there today in this talk are uh, always thinking about it, particularly as your instructors as well, how do people make sense and interact with these technologies and how can we keep the humanity, right, uh, in place? And for us in the, in the Air Force, that's a big deal. We want people involved uh, in these environments. We don't want uh, total autonomy. We want people to really uh, uh, be uh, augmented uh, with AI and machine learning. And so, um, um, and we have another category called employ, and that's and that's where you know we're we're um, looking at people that have the ability to really at the program level think about you know all the pieces that go together, like a systems perspective, right? About how to support AI and personnel and and logistics and so forth. You can go to the next slide. And I apologize oh. for these wordy slides, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to make sure we we did address the framework. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's important, Andy. I had something to add, but then I lost the thread, so I'll, I'll chime in with that in a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Here's our next slide. And once again, I know we're heavy into models and descriptions, but the reason we are is we know some people are not able to attend today, and they want some of this information to figure out how they can participate. Back to you, Andy. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, one of the things that we try to do in, in all of our train education uh, efforts in the Air Force and, and in our virtual harmony uh, perspective, because a lot of things that we prototype in virtual harmony, uh, we carry over to each of our organizations and universities. And, and there, there's a wonderful reciprocality associated with uh, the fact that, you know, we can do a lot of that uh, prototyping effort in, in our uh, virtual harmony and then think about the pragmatics of the application in each of our organizations. So competencies, uh, we've always sort of paid attention to. And I'm not going to go through all these competencies here, but they're worth, uh, you know, when you get a, a chance to look at the details on the slides, uh, they're worth looking at. Um, uh, we're still working on this, by the way, across Department of Defense, but this is our first cut. So you're looking at this. This just came out, by the way, a few weeks ago. So you're, you're looking at this fairly fresh <laughs> uh, in, in terms of how we're thinking about these competencies. Um, so the, the and you'll notice there's really an interesting uh, part of this, and that is it has to do with the ethics of AI. And we, you know, we, we really want responsible use of AI. Um, I was in a meeting uh, just a few days ago with the Department of Defense CIO, and, and, and we had a workshop where we brought in all these experts in ethics uh, around the country uh, to uh, help us really be better aware of the kinds of challenges that we can expect. Uh, not only in terms of, you know, what we should be thinking about with the design of capabilities, but also the usage of AI. You know, as, as we get into, um, you know, scenarios associated with how we do the things that we can do, uh, we want to make sure that the people that have responsibility, right, for the usage of AI are very much aware of, um, you know, the uh, expectations that we will have. And, and the United States, by the way, is one of the few countries that actually has published their AI ethical guidelines and standards, and it just got published a few months ago on, on the world scene. So uh, the United States is working very, very hard to sort of lead uh, ethical usage of AI. The next one, please. Hey, Andy, I remembered yep. what I wanted to say. Oh, great. <laughs> a couple of, it might have been two or three years ago, and of course this was stimulated by Dancers Yao from the nonprofit Commons who invited us to submit a proposal for the Institute for the Future, I think that's the name of it, 
correct me if I'm wrong, they all start to blend together. I'm probably quoting D Dr. Jay McGonigal's. But in any event, the Elon Musk team that works on AI safety, they put out grants for educators to participate, evaluate ethics and the safe use of AI in the future and to stimulate research in this area. So Andy, Barbara Truman, and I organized a proposal and Barbara submitted on this very notion. And we were trying to think, how does an artificially intelligent system make good ethical decisions and strive for beneficence, right? And I know you're thinking, well, what about Asimov's laws or Heinlein or you know, all the science fiction modeling we have about ethics? And I says, we need to go beyond that. <laughs> we need we need something a lot more discreet. So we were thinking about that. And of course, Andy had some wonderful suggestions that we incorporated in our proposal. While it was not funded, performing that exercise had great value for me because it helped me to organize my thoughts. And the grant submission required you to go through so so many deep rubrics to think through all the different um, impacts. And so it helps to organize your thinking. So I recommend, even if you never intend that, that you always grab these artifacts and think them through because they frame the conversation, in my opinion, for your own safety in the future. And students, your your community. Let's see, Andy. We'll go to, now. This is the fun okay. slide. Back to you. Oh, okay. Um, well, the the um, one of the things that we just wanted to make sure that we had a chance to speak briefly to was the underlying architecture uh, that supports the means for us to prototype um, the usage of AI for educational benefits in a hybrid. Uh, environment that involves uh, immersive 3D worlds, uh, web, website tools and resources, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality components. And um, we got we got involved, I guess, Lear, uh, uh, a, a few years ago with hybrid models and architectures, uh, a little ahead of, of the times. But now, actually, hybrid um, models are, are really in vogue. And, and um, so uh, we find we have a lot of people that visit what we do that from different universities around the world that will come out and, and see the, the, the ways that we stitch together the data exchange across the uh, cloud environment. Uh, we use uh, Amazon cloud services and, um, and authentication services, um, and we use a, a whole a range of different types of um, scripting languages, everything from Python uh, uh, down to Node uh, uh, JavaScript uh, servers. And so we, we do a lot of uh, uh, testing for uh, how to actually uh, try to make it as transparent as we can for uh, integrating you know, AI and machine learning uh, into our work that we do to demonstrate it. And for example, one of the things I do for Air University, I, I assist with an AI seminar for our students. And but we, we have a uh, Virtual Harmony maintains a, an AI bibliography. We collect uh, literally hundreds upon hundreds of research uh, resources on AI. And we, and we uh, the machine learning components uh, meta tag all the different related constructs across these hundreds of uh, research uh, papers and resources so that when you do the search, uh, it pulls up the most relevant um, pieces of things that you may be interested in across different concept layers. So that's pretty powerful so that you can, when you do an actual search, Andy, your microphone cut out, so if you have a little mute there. If you've lost connection, boy, am I in for a good time, right? <laughs> now, while he's getting his microphone going again, this is Lear, right? Um, Lear. Hello, all. That's good. Yeah, you bet. Um, we live this stuff. You, if you're looking at the left side, excuse me, the right side of the slide, that's just... And for those of you who don't have strong camera controls, just hold your Alt key down or Command key Zoom on in with the screen. Left click the slides. But um, on the right, right hand side, you're seeing a list of 12 of our grids. 
And of course, we have 14 or 15 more now, thanks to Frankie Antoinette. Oh, he's calling to let me know that he has lost connection. Hang on one sec. Let's see. I'm going to put you on speaker, Andy, if you want to keep talking. Let's see if they can hear you. Ah. So, uh, so if you can put me through your, your, your system, that way I can keep talking. <laughs> Let's see if the audience can hear you. Uh, I'll do a little sound check. Can you guys hear him? Okay, can you keep, hear me? Yeah, they can. Now, Andy, okay. what I was doing was I was explaining that the right side of the slide is showing the grids on okay. which we've created game simulations and survival quests and um, uh, team building, shared leadership. Uh, the McMurdo Station for the Antarctic is a newer station. Uh, Pompeii is newer. Uh, and, of course, uh, Frankie has worked on uh, Seca... Majiro, I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but our latest Japanese sim. A little bit of everything out there. Of course, Kathy and uh, Betty have been responsible for some of our other other sites that are just absolutely wonderful. All right. So we take all these technologies and we weave them together and we try to characterize open source solutions that might serve as a framework and a template for other other uses for the public use. So think of that side as the open education component of what we're doing for the OER side. And then uh, the proprietary side is if we're going to stage important events that involve the mil military education or broader audience like the Global Learning Forum, then we need a, a scalable solution that allows larger populations to join us. And that's why we're still thinking the virtual world, but we use Amazon cloud services. So with with relatively less effort, I make this sound far too easy than perhaps it is, Andy can move everything into the cloud quite quickly and get ready for, for the global event. Andy, did you want to add anything there? Uh, that's, that's wonderful. I'm so happy that uh, you, you highlight the, the variety of the grids because one of the things that we've learned is that every uh, aspect of people's interests with these kinds of environments um, uh, is is very multidisciplinary. So one of the things that I think draws people's uh, uh, you know curiosity with the things that we do is you know if they're if they're scientists, we've had physicists interested in what we do. If they're computer scientists or engineers or in the humanities, uh, uh, we we try to represent part of the possible. Uh, with how you apply AI machine learning in our simulations across a very wide variety of academic areas. So, yeah, I'm so happy you brought that up. The, the, the next slide, if you, if you have it up there, and it's the learning pathway. Yes, I do. And by the way, I must apologize to our listening audience. I normally type while Andy's doing this, but that's impossible to do while holding a phone. Up near my mouth. Oh, you're losing spin. You can't hear him. Okay, uh, I'll make sure uh, that I keep my uh, my my uh, phone right here. <laughs> okay, I think they mean your avatar body disappeared. I think Frankie is okay. It's a sound too. So I'm having to hold this in a very unusual way. Uh, so anyway, go right ahead there. But my apologies for not typing to the audience. Okay, so we're doing learning yeah. journey pathways. Thank you, Frankie. Wait. We are not. We are. We are not going to, wet, to uh, let a storm interfere with our talk. Right? <laughs> we never do. <laughs> uh, so, so part of uh, it, it, which I hope you can. Uh, we we are tracking uh, journey pathway, learning journey pathways. Now, this is these are the kinds of pathways that Department of Defense is envisioning with AI education, and so. What we're doing is emphasizing all the key components of those competencies uh, across these five areas as we put together uh, examples of what we do. So area one deals with the augmentation of what we call the human mental system, and that's where we cover a lot of the fundamentals of human cognition. And there's just a wealth of research underway in cognition science, cognitive science. Area two, where you know we talk about um, you know what machine learning really does, acquire, helping us to acquire 
uh, all of these insights from big data, you know, how the algorithms can go through these big data uh, sets involving hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of, use of cases and bring uh, us uh, better able to see the patterns associated with the, the data. And of course, in area three, we have to take that data uh, that's been processed by uh, AI machine learning, and we have to use it uh, to make better decisions with. We don't want to make worse decisions, we want to improve on our decision-making capability. Now, here's a really fascinating aspect of this work. Uh, this requires the means to deal with different types of reasoning. Uh, what we find is that when we get to probabilistic reasoning, you know, when you look at, okay, what, what is the likelihood of these events being related uh, as it would, uh, you know, uh, that I need to pay attention to for making a, a better decision? Well, one of the things that artificial intelligence machine learning helps with is exactly uh, events that are conditionally related, you know, in terms of probability. Um, you know, one of the most classic examples of where this can go wrong was the Challenger disaster, you know, that Richard yes. Feynman uh, did an investigation of after it happened. You know, he very eloquently about the, the problems that we all have, right? When we're looking at, you know, the conditional likelihood of events occurring, even if they're very small, minute probabilities, uh, they can accumulate. And so what we try to do in our work is help people to understand, okay, what what can AI and machine learning do that's helpful, and what are the parts of our decision-making role that we ought to always value? So, so the question obviously comes up, well, what is it that people do well that AI and machine learning don't do as well or are really not well at all right now? Well, the thing that we highlight is, is in intuition. Our inductive reasoning uh, is a strength that human humans bring, right, our experiences uh, that we have in life informs, okay, a lot of these subtleties associated with the emotive level of how we uh, get along with others in teams and how we work together well in problem solving, that is irreplaceable. And so we, when, we, when we help our, our people that come in to see the work that we do, we always like to point that out, that and almost all the things that we're doing with AI and machine learning, we're augmenting capability. We're not replacing capability. So that's the area four, right? Because one of the things, and, and there you can talk to this more at length here, but in everything we do, it's always group-oriented and team-focused. Because as it, it's usually the case in real life, right, um, we, we, we tend to have to, you know, solve problems together. And we uh, over the years, then I've always laughed, right, because so often, and if, for many of you, recall where you, know, you, you can go through almost your entire academic, formal academic life and, and complete assignments and get grades and credit for courses, and it's pretty much, you know, a solitary journey. But that's not as much as it had been in years ago, but it's, it's still, you know, uh, quite a bit, uh, you know, people, you know, are tend, tend, tend to be evaluated in their schoolhouse programs based on their individual efforts. But in real life, <laughs> your success and, and the organization's success is really dependent on how well you do things with others and teams. Sounds great. So, yeah. It, it, to, this, to this intent, we wrote a book chapter a few years back on cognitive remapping for teams because we understand how our learners suffer greatly. They, it, as soon as you say the words team project, it's like there's a collective groan, especially you know, for online students, doctoral students, they seem to always want to work independently and they don't seem to realize that, that uh, not only do teams make better products, but having great team relationships doesn't happen by accident. <laughs> it's a it's part of the culture that we want to nurture and foster. And so so one of the things I I, I had earlier uh, was this, the the importance of ethics and having a a, a, a really deeper appreciation mm -hmm. of why ethics matters. Now I want to just highlight uh, we do work with Columbia University and uh, and and MIT and one of the things that they have uh, uh, worked on for several years is, you know, um, 
How do you help people improve upon their critical thinking skills throughout uh, uh, their lifespan of professional work? And what they found is absolutely fascinating. There's one thing to be smart in terms of, you know, intellectual capabilities and so forth. It's, it's also very important that you develop your ethical, moral reasoning. So, so as, you, as you deal with complexity, almost all complex situations have a moral, ethical component. But if you're, if you're not developing yourself in the same levels of growth, uh, as you are with your into other intellectual uh, skill sets or competencies, you, sh you actually end up shortchanging your ability to deal with complexity. If you don't, you know, in parallel, develop yourself your moral and ethical reasoning abilities. So this has been an aha insight for the Air Force and, and for many, I'm, I'm sure, of you that are listening in today, that uh, almost in every area of our curriculum, uh, we need to be focusing on the moral, ethical dilemmas associated with practice. You know, just to that point, Andy, I'm teaching. So oh, yeah, sorry, I'm teaching futuring and innovation right now. So I'm teaching the side of this puzzle where we stimulate the ideas for these great in, in innovations and to nurture them. And of course, I was trying to explain to students why. I mean, you would think it'd be a no-brainer, but when you have to provide a rationalization as to why we need some ethics and moral discussions within our technology classes, I explained to them, I says, well, that's what makes science fiction so interesting. The mad scientist didn't start out as the bad guy uh, you know, by default. When we pursued science without thinking through all of the ramifications for societal good, you know, and if we don't put in certain safeguards to protect ourselves, we can uh, wander over to the dark side, so to speak. <laughs> and of course, we have conversations about that. I know it may seem frivolous to talk about science fiction, and yet, let's face it, in a lot of my futuring discussions, we look at the parallels between how fiction stimulates some of our ventures into the art of the possible. You want me to go to the next slide, Andy? Uh, yeah, yeah, the next slide. And you should have the, uh, the high-level framework example uh, that, that basically shows Kahneman's, uh, Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. Uh, one of the things that we do uh, is look at temporal issues associated with uh, the timing of your your ability to uh, be aware of, of what is best suited for the situation you find yourself in. <laughs> That's right. So if you're in a situation that survival is really critical, uh, you've got to think fast. If, if you take out your slide ruler, I'm dating myself now. If you take out your slide ruler and start trying to calculate all the escape routes, uh, you, that may be the end of you under dire uh, uh, situations. <laughs> so, for, so for example, with a lot of my students, uh, you know, that, that you know have experience uh, in combat and so forth, uh, if I get to this 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 visual, they immediately connect. They they perfectly get it, right? That. Um, you know, there are situations that call for quick thinking and, 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 a, and a fast reaction. And they also get it, that slow thinking part, because, you know, uh, you can be outsmarted uh, and, and you can find yourself, uh, you know, boxed in with choices uh, because, you know, you didn't really take the time to uh, be aware in, in all the ways. Now, of course, the art and science of all this is how to balance fast and slow thinking. But think of it this way. How do you balance fast and slow thinking when you're being augmented with artificial intelligence machine learning? And there, and, and there's the experience that we have to introduce to our students through these simulations and these immersive virtual experiences. We have to create really engaged scenarios that are built off of real-life kinds of challenges so they can actually experience what does it feel like cognitively and emotionally to encounter the different fast changing situations and know how to adapt. Mm -hmm. you to well, that? you know, you reminded me of a team building exercise we had at, at, on campus one year. And I think everyone can relate to this. In this team building exercise, they had deans and uh, faculty and staff and IT folks and even our facilities folks were all there together. And they asked us to 
Pretend we are in a cave, an underwater cave, and it's filling with water, and only two people are going to make it out. And then they ask us, who goes, who, who, gets to, who gets to live? And so everyone's starting to debate this and do all this various stuff. And then they turned to me, and I said, I've typed a, I, I had written it out. I said, I typed a, tied a rope around my waist, started swimming, handed, handed you the other end, and I'm hoping to get more people out than two. <laughs> And, and, of course, they said, oh, that's so cruel. You would leave us behind. I said, no, I wouldn't. It's just if we have an orderly exit with the opportunity for more people to get through, it's like the Kobayashi Maru. I don't believe in no-win scenarios, and I don't believe in talking about it. Once you're in a situation where you need a reaction, you need action quickly. Now, this doesn't mean that I would neglect the moral and ethical principles behind it, but all I'm saying is, the more we debate at, in a time of action, the harder it is you know, to get enough of a response to save lives. And yeah. so, uh, but, but of course, ever since, everyone looks at me, gives me the fishy eye, you know. <laughs> because I, I'm like, I'm a gamer. Gamers don't wait. <laughs> but we also don't rush the door <laughs> in any event. Um, so this is a slide that you'll want to hang on to. There's a wealth of information here. You'll notice all the machine levels of automation on the lower right from high to low. You'll also see what Andy was talking about with the system fast and slow thinking in the upper right. And then all of these other areas, he, he, has, a, he has a gift for combining a ton of information. And so... <laughs> and so think I, I get paid by the number of blocks and colors. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of it. It was so fun. We were invited to speak at the uh, Gordon Research Conference a few years ago, and and uh, I'm, I'm looking at the time. We have about 15 minutes. And um, I, the, our predecessor was talking about games and virtual worlds, and they showed all these images from the world, right, which are cool. But the scientists who had gathered, there were over 200 of them, all looked at each other and said, well, you need more models, right? So I smiled. Andy and I were speaking next, and next thing you know, we have four models per page. <laughs> and then afterwards, they were like, "Well, maybe a few, something in between." <laughs> but I had to laugh because without the theory, well, yeah, the time that we have, yeah. I, what, I, what we like to do is oh, yes. of the Here we go. We've created uh, that support this kind of framework. Here's the first AI. one, Andy. We're showing AI right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you should see now the, the uh, what we call the AI uh, Strategy and Concepts Hub. And this hub helps to integrate uh, the information across the hybrid uh, environment. So we've got data flowing from our virtual world simulations in the hub. We have, uh, we have instruments that we give to our students. That data flows into the hub. We have our bibliography. Tools are all connected to the hub. Even even our weekly blog that we do connected into the hub. But uh, we're going to go through this. Uh, if, if that's okay, uh, send just a sure. bit faster. So that's if you go to the, the one that I show you, the blog, for example. Um, each week we generate uh, a thought piece uh, for people, and, and this goes up to uh, uh, air, the uh, the Pentagon each week. Uh, so it's kind of fun because uh, we have several. We have about look, about over a hundred people now that track what we do. In our our little community as we prototype and try things out. And uh, so each week we kind of summarize some of the you know, some of the big concepts associated with the challenges uh, of, of, of working with AI machine uh, learning uh, possibilities. And so. Uh, um, you know, so it, it's it's quite, and, and we we relate these uh, these blog entries back into the uh, seminars and workshop structures. So if you go to the next slide, if I'm not pushing too fast, no, you're fine. Uh, we have a dashboard, and in that dashboard, uh, this is a, a a piece that we modified from uh, the work that MIT and Stanford did with Open edX, and basically it's a You there, Andy? Where you, you can go through and self-pace, or you can work, you know, with others. But it basically, you know, is really I, I ideally suited for competency. How you're tracking against competency. 
if you if you go to the next slide, Cynthia, if I'm not moving too fast, you're fine. You can see some of the uh, seminars that we uh, have been working on and putting together. So a lot of this, of course, has a military theme, but <laughs> but you can also uh, get a sense that um, you know across those five areas that I highlighted early, uh, we're we're going deeper into the details associated with what does the current research suggest. What we know is, is, is the key insights for us to be thinking about. And in, and in second, what does it look like and feel like to actually try out that knowledge, right, in a, sim, in, in, in a, in a simulation? So, so if you go to the, if you, if you keep working your way down, there's, uh, uh, Sam, you can, you can go to the next one. Yeah, I'm on the cognition of war with the face at the bottom. Perfect, perfect. So, so here, so, so we, what we want to do is obviously uh, with our students help them understand the core ideals and or concepts behind these areas of the framework and the competencies of AI. But then we want to then take them uh, deeper into um, the uh, um, you know trying out the particular competency. So if you go to the next one, as you work your way down through the details of these seminars, you can see there's activities introduced to them, and, uh, and, and we even uh, um, reach out to other universities, and, when we, and we plug in. So one of the things, um, we we're so grateful Yale agreed to uh, uh, connect in the work that they had done uh, with AI superpowers. They did a, a very wonderful workshop uh, of their experts. Uh, looking at AI superpower issues between China and and the United States and and so forth, and so we 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 embed that into seminar structure. And so one of the things that we've had benefit over the years is this very strong institutional partnership. So we've done things uh, with MIT, Columbia, Harvard, Stanford, uh, Caltech. Caltech has has has. Uh, worked with us frequently, and they worked with us on the Mars simulation, but they also are working with us now on our AI things. And so, are, are you showing the slide right now, Cindy, where we have the Yale um, 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 webinar? Yes. Okay, perfect. Now that you're on that, let's go to the next one. <laughs> well, wait a minute. So this is the one with the AI superpowers, uh, China, Silicon Valley, and the new arms race. So lots of different conversations are going on here. By the way, I did pepper something one-handed with one finger into the chat. <laughs> it's a link to the 1,100 references. So you could search or, or look at some of these for yourself later. Right now, the server's offline because the farmhouse is dark, right? But when it comes back online, <laughs> and this is another reason why the cloud is, is very helpful, you know in our research, but right now I'm only looking at the farmhouse. Okay, Andy, we're on the uh, satellite view or map view of the decision-making war game. Okay, okay. Um, if you, so this, this is uh, a simulation that uh, has been uh, studied uh, more recently because it simulates uh, an incident uh, between Japan and China uh, you know, uh, theoretical kinds of incidents, you know, what to do if this or that happens. And now this particular uh, simulation that we have worked on uh, is, is in Python. And so uh, one, one of the, uh, the scripting tools that we use quite extensively uh, in, in the things that uh, we do is Python. And so this gives you an example of, you know, how we take, we can take a traditional desktop-like simulation and, and, and embed it into the, uh, the architecture. So what's really cool is the data that flows out of this simulation uh, gets put into our databases that can be fed into all across the, uh, the framework. So if you go to the next slide, you can see the choices that we offer uh, as you set the game properties up. You have to let me know, Sam, about how you want to go through, and, and, and we embed, uh, you know, Google Maps uh, into uh, the, the scenario, so you can see an example of that. Oh, sure. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm on the uh, human AI teaming survey. I just want to talk to that real. 
I can. So Hang on one second. value in self-assessment where people can go in and take a self-assessed uh, survey about how they think about why certain areas may matter with AI uh, areas or competency. So in this our survey, all the different uh, issues associated with uh, do you, you know, your your beliefs and attitudes towards how much AI should do versus what people should do, uh, how trust, trustful you are of AI systems, uh, and, and whether you should be or not, uh, your, 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 your perspective about whether ethics uh, is really important to you know, uh, be prepared for and, and you know, ethical moral reasoning and, and what levels you self-assess yourself in those. So it's kind of a really interesting survey. And, and we and we do this kind of survey design for uh, uh, multiple universities. And so when you when you take the survey uh, behind the scenes, we take the data from your your, your uh, simulation with plum blossoms, map that survey response to to look at a neural net model for how far along do we project you will go in gameplay. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> And it's pretty cool because you got you get a really good uh, sense of how AI and machine learning uh, systems can uh, help us with predictions. One of the most powerful benefits of these systems, right, is their ability to help us look at a little bit with some level of confidence about, okay, if, for example, if, if you're on a, if you're going to sign up to go to Mars, what's the likelihood? That um, you might you might survive at least getting to Mars. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and why would it matter that uh, we would be able to give you an assessment device and, and and be able to with greater precision help you be better prepared to survive that trip to Mars and hopefully bring you back home safely? You see. That's right. Thank you, Andy. You know. Um, that maps back to our research. For those of you who are unfamiliar with it, we, we are always asking the question, is it possible to investigate and address complex problems? And these are problems that don't have a solution, as opposed to complicated problems that the, the solution criteria at least exists. But of course, it's very challenging for us to put it together. But in a complex problem, it's not possible today, necessarily with today's technology. So we're always thinking, what will it take to make that possible, and what are all the ramifications? So instruments like this help to collect all that data, and of course, to probabilistically make decisions on how accurate will be our, our predictions. You know, you reminded me of something, Andy, and I see we have about four minutes left. Um, Yes. Of, of, of what the neural net generates for each person. That, that should be the final one before the question slide. You see the little box plots that the neural net generates for each person? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. And I, just a concluding uh, 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 thoughts here to share uh, is that one of the most powerful, and we write about this in our work, but one of the most powerful benefits of immersive 3D worlds uh, gets at the work done by Georgia Tech and Nancy Nasserian. Uh, she's now at Harvard, but uh, you know she has pioneered model-based reasoning, you know, in the in the STEM areas, and um, we got uh, really excited about her work several years ago for creating these really immersive 3D models that you can manipulate and do the what ifs. And, and what that does gives you a way to kind of test your understanding. Are you really comprehending the concepts well enough to account for something? That's right. <laughs> That's so, right. So, so one of the things that we try to do in almost all of our work is bring in data visualization uh, that's informed by data and your performance to give you that kind of feedback. So you can say, ah, I thought I understood what this was about. And so <laughs> if, if you ever get a chance to come out and visit us in Virtual Harmony and see some of our simulations, you'll see that in every one of them, you're going to be asked to manipulate something, you're going to be asked to try to make sense of what you're manipulating, and then you're going to get feedback.
Well, thank you, Andy. That's been wonderful. Are there any questions for our audience? <laughs> and of course, well, he can't I, necessarily well, hear I, the answer, I, right? Probably, I guess I'm a ghost. You hear my voice, but you don't see me. But, uh, well, but it's I, not... I just want to thank all of you for the opportunity. You know, we always love the, the chance to share about our work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and put the phone down for a moment, Andy. And uh, but to hang on, you're right here. You're still on speaker. But of course, um, and there's an applause. By the way, Bethany says, "Hey, applause!" And um, uh, I know it's hard to ask questions because you're like, "Well, I'm trying to frame this experience and try to figure out." But imagine it this way: if you participated in one of our simulation games, or you flew to Mars and you flew to the space station, and then you flew up to the planet itself. And as you go around and interact with things, we have this AI agent called the Red Queen that you can ask questions of. And it maps to an ontology from MIT that um, classifies knowledge, right? Gathers in input from you, the player, and then, of course, tries to rank and prioritize and give you the best information possible, but also learns from you. I think is a rather fascinating piece of the puzzle. Now, if you ever do want to join us and, and check this out, I know several people have tried here recently, and of course, we have to be well, you know, a, a few members of our team, you know, sometimes we need a little more time, but we do meet every Sunday at 2 o'clock um, mountain time. I always think of it in my time, right? 1 o'clock Pacific. And so you're always welcome to come out and visit with us. Each week we do something different. So don't think it's all about the space program. No, no. We, uh, <laughs> right now we're we're uh, studying in in Japan at the moment, and uh, Frankie Antonelli. We're going to talk about that tomorrow in our session at four o'clock on uh, with our community. Thank you, everyone. Any questions? As we close, I want to thank no, our organizers. No, I think I think that this is the first time we actually closed on time. No, you say that, but we always close on time. <laughs> Two o'clock on Sundays, Bethany, is when we get together. And, of course, um, we want to put a shout-out to Patty Rangel, who's been trying to come out and join us. And, of course, you know, during a pandemic, our, our we, we, we wound up dancing and playing, and we had festivals and we did all these things to encourage our spirit so that we do better work, right? <laughs> so it's not all work. We also do a lot of play as well. Yes, um, we don't publish the information publicly, but we will give you access to it privately. So you just have to contact me. And, of course, the servers for all the, um, the uh, education research that we were talking about, I can give you the links here, but until the storm passes and the servers come back online, we are offline for the moment. But we will be back uh, as soon as the storm passes. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the servers are actually running because we have a, a backup power. Uh, yeah, they say the offline servers, to but, uh, me, but maybe but, they're but online for others. The internet connection is what we're suffering from right oh, now. Oh, <laughs> I see. So servers are running, but the internet's down. Yeah, well, it looks offline. So, And that's the first time I've had an offline message. So it would be during our session. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a great conference. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.